So we'll just give them about a minute to come in. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. We're very excited to have our co-host for this whole series, Dr. Shala Masood uh, from Jacksonville, uh, to talk to you about pathological uh, pathoradiological correlation cases for breast cancer. I will let Dr. Masood um, introduce herself and take it away. And then uh, after she's done, we'll come back and do questions. Remember, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, and we will answer those at the end. If you have a technical problem, please use the chat. Please, Dr. Masood, go ahead. Um, thank you very much, and good morning to everyone. Um, I'm excited that I have this opportunity to talk to a group of pathologists that I don't see them, but I know the significance of their work in Nigeria. So um, I'm the Chair of Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and uh, also Medical Director of Breast Center and Interim Director of our Cancer Program. Of course, you have the opportunity of asking the question as Dr. Milner had already indicated. So um, I will remove myself from the presentation as far as my picture so that you will be able to just focus on what I have to offer you today. And thank you again very much for um, your attention. And I wish I was there in person to meet all of you. So have a great uh, time. And that, that, is, that is what I'm going to do. So today, as you know, I will be talking about the pathological correlation cases in breast both surgical and pathology and cytopathology. And what I did, so what I did, I decided within this two hour period of that I have, I will just present to you some of the most important information in breast pathology collectively and that are current and are important to know. And then ultimately, hopefully if you have time, move towards the cases that I have sent you so that we can go over that pathology radiology correlation. So my plan is to summarize the changing role of pathologists from morphology to molecular biology and present an overview of molecular characterization of breast cancer and its impact on clinical care. Follow that, we discuss the role of minimally invasive diagnostic procedures, finding the last version biopsy versus core needle biopsy, and demonstrate the significance of radiology and pathology correlation in providing accurate diagnosis. To begin with, I want to just remind all of us that pathology is the study of human illness, <clears throat> and pathology report is the study of illness of a patient. So it's very important for us to really take the function of, you know, finding the roadmap to the, to the clinical management of the patients with variety of illnesses. Now, the way that we were, long time ago, pathology diagnosis was based on gross examination and light microscopy. And the most common diagnosis was undifferentiated malignant neoplasm. So things changed. There were significant progression in science and technology. Therefore, the emergence of new technologies 
molecular characterization of tumors, the stratification of patients for therapy based on tumor characteristics, and a paradigm shift in patient care resulted in the fact that there were much more expectation <clears throat> of pathologists in a variety of different areas of medicine. And in respect to breast cancer, one of the most important components that has occurred in really promotion of multidisciplinary integrated breast care, where all the parties, all the physicians, all the healthcare providers engaged in taking care of a patient are working together. So it's a patient-focused, patient-friendly environment where we have to have all of these components work in coordination with each other in order to be able to provide the best patient-focused individualized care to each individual patient. And of course, pathology has become a very important component of this process. And of course, pathology and radiology, they're all very much intertwined in their ability to provide that initial diagnosis that is essential for follow-up management of each patient. Now, therefore, there is a changing role of pathologists. Right now, we not only have to establish a diagnosis, we need to classify a neoplasm, differentiate between a primary versus a metastasic tumor, predict a response to therapy, and provide a prognosis. Therefore, what we need to do and what is expected of us in breast pathology reporting is to include all of these components into our report. Tumor size and the type, histologic grading, lymphovascular invasion, lymph node status, the status of surgical margins, presence or absence of practical carcinoma in situ, multisensitivity, multifocality, and presence or absence of nipple involvement and ulceration. So that is a sort of a given process that is required of us. Furthermore, we need to have the ability to predict the response to therapy. And that includes assessment of the status of expression of estrogen progesterone receptors, which is required for endocrine therapy. Assessment of the pattern of gene amplification and protein expression of her oncogene, which is for perceptin therapy. And of course, assessment of new genetic molecular pathways that is happening and is being brought on board almost every single day. Now, let's focus on estrogen progesterone receptors. These are the oldest predictive factors for endocrine therapy. Assessment of hormone receptors are currently based on immunocytochemistry. And immunocytochemical analysis for hormone receptors can be done on formal and fixed tissue, small tumor sam samples, and cytologic repression. This is the first slide of the use of fine needle aspiration biopsy and cytologic repression using monoclonal antibody to try to assess the presence of presence or absence of estrogen receptor. And you can see very nice brown nuclear staining that shows expression of estrogen receptor in this malignant fine needle aspiration biopsy. They're almost like a twin slides that one is the morphology, which is malignant. And this is an expression of a poorly differentiated breast cancer. And of course, the corresponding hormone receptor. This is one of the first um, examples or reported um, cases of using monoclonal antibody for assessment of hormone receptors. Following that, we were able to use DNAs and other um, technology to try to modify what it used to be that you needed to have fresh tissue, which was naturally challenging. And we were able to have the uh, formally fixed tissue of breast cases to undergo assessment of estrogen receptor. And you can see a very nice expression of hormone receptors in this specific breast cancer patient. Now, let us move to uh, her 2 oncogene. 
The discovery of HER2 oncogene has been one of the most important recent development in breast cancer. The thermogenetic benefit, therapeutic effect of herceptin therapy has provided strong evidence of proof of principle and is a fine example of translational research. What happened that HER2 oncogene was discovered in 1983 and this HER2 oncogene is located in the short arm of chromosome 17. And amplification over overexpression of HER2 oncogene is associated with aggressive tumor behavior through enhanced growth proliferation, increased invasive and metastatic capability, and stimulation of angiogenesis. And this is the seminal and the initial report by Dr. Sleman who was really owning the concept and his discovery and his work in her oncogene really led to a revolution in the way the breast cancer has been undergoing therapy. And he clearly showed that cases and breast cancer cases that there is no amplification of her oncogene, they do much better than the patients that they show amplification of her oncogene. So from that point of view, this is something that has really changed the entire pattern of practice of breast care in respect to uh, prognostic and predictive factors. And of course, assessment of her oncogene works to try to provide prognosis. And of course, it is the predictive of response to her septin therapy, not only in metastasis to breast cancer, which was initially, you know, sort of presented, but also right now in every hormone receptor, uh, her oncogene positive primary breast cancer that has become an important component of herceptin therapy. her oncogene can be assessed through either immunocytochemistry or through fluorescent in cytohybridization technology called FISH. Now, this is the example of the scope or a spectrum of changes that you see that HER2 oncogene by immunocytochemistry shows evidence of um, nice cell membrane type of brown staining. This is expression of a high level or three plus immunostaining, which is regarded as positive and naturally makes the patient to receive herceptin therapy. Then we have two plus, which is less remarkable in respect to intensity of the slide and the number of tumor cells. We have one plus that is naturally much lesser and then much lesser number of tumor cells show this membrane staining and negative is the one who doesn't have anything. Therefore, right now, based on all of the recommendations, um, we call things negative, um, one plus, two plus, or three plus. Um, one plus occasionally can be looked at as a sort of low her oncogene, and two plus cases are the one that they need to undergo fish technology for confirmation of the presence or absence of her gene amplification. And this is an you know example of non-amplified breast tumor case that you only see the chromosome 17, whereas here you can see this amplified version of her oncogene in chromosome 17 of breast tumor cells. So the question is that what is the significance of accurate prognostic and predictive testing? That is selection of those patients who will most likely benefit from systemic therapy, offering personalized medicine with greater safety and effectiveness, and providing affordable and cost-effective care. And that is incredibly important to really keep under consideration because these therapy are expensive and they're associated with some side effect. And we need, and the pathologists have significant responsibility to make sure that the report that we provide to the clinician and patients, they are 100% accurate. We have recognized that up to 30% of women with node negative breast cancer die of the disease regardless of adjuvant therapy. And up to 70% survive without adjuvant therapy. 
So heterogeneity in breast cancer cannot be captured by traditional prognostic factors. That is the reason that there was a need to better define the biological complexity of breast cancer, and that led to development of more sophisticated and sensitive testing to better stratify patients for systemic therapy. So the solution was development and introduction of gene expression profiling that provides an opportunity to classify tumors at the genomic level into subclass of potential prognostic and predictive significance. So, Dr. Sorley, many years ago, he was able to use gene, you know, gene profiling and was able to make and introduce a new classification of breast cancer. You can see a different pattern of expression using a variety of the genetic markers. And then it led to the fact that he introduced that we have you know, different kind of breast cancer, which is called luminal subtype A and the luminal subtype B, L2 no oncogen positive basal cell type and normal breast like type. He further showed that these subclassification of the breast tumors would lead to a different probability in respect to the behavior and outcome of the patients with breast cancer. In here, we look at overall survival that naturally luminal type do much better than basal type. And then the same thing is time to distant metastasis that luminal type do better. So he was able to provide a better prognosticator prognostic and predictive factors in response to the outcome of the patient with breast cancer. So currently, it is recognized that breast cancer is a family of diseases, and it is divided that ER positive luminal A, ER positive luminal B, HER2 oncogen positive, basal-like triple negative cases, and unclassified or normal breast-like, that this is something that still is under consideration and study. Luminal A and B, they generally carry a good prognosis. Luminal A has better prognosis than type B. Um, but, and then we expect better response to endocrine therapy in luminal subtypes. Luminal B is the one that may also benefit, benefit from chemotherapy. And these are the combination of you know, well-differentiated and moderately differentiated tumor cells that they are hormone receptor positive, both estrogen and progesterone receptor. Then we have her 2 no positive type, that as you can see that by immuno, and this is the by fluorescent technology, this tumor can present as two distinct forms, ER negative and ER positive, and are frequently associated with ductal carcinoma in situ, and is associated, they are associated with poor prognosis. Another type is basal-like breast cancers. And up to now, we have no internationally accepted definition for this entity. Triple negative phenotype represent ER, PR, and two negative subtypes. And there are expression of high molecular weight cytokeratins, and as it is listed in here, that make basal-like breast cancer a very unique and different kind of breast subtype. Morphologically, they are presenting with poorly differentiated tumor with this geographic necrosis. And then you see high proliferation rate, and you can see the number of mitosis and individual cell necrosis in individual tumors. And they have the lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate with the medullary carcinoma-like features. They are very distinct when they're seen. When you look at biology of basal-like breast carcinoma, they account for 10 to 20 percent of all breast cancer. They are seen more frequently in young patients. They are more prevalent in African American women more prevalent in those with germline BRCA1 mutation carriers. They're biologically more aggressive, have a unique metastatic pattern, 
and majority of death occurs in the first five years after primary tumor. Triple negative breast cancer represents the majority of cancers within basal like subtype, but not all triple negative breast cancer display the basal like phenotype and vice versa, because we have tumors such as adenocystic carcinoma or metaplastic carcinomas that they are not really basal like tumor cells, but they have negative, triple negative expression of hormone receptors and HER2 oncogene. Currently, no specific targeted approach is available for triple negative breast cancer. So to summarize the concept, the current status of practice is that patients with hormone receptor positive herpetononcogen negative tumors benefit from adjuvant hormone therapy. Patients with herpetononcogen positive tumors, any ERPR or menopausal status derive major benefits from the administration of one year of receptin therapy in combination with chemotherapy. Now, what is next? The direction is that there is a need to develop additional forms of systemic therapy for those tumors that fail to express hormone receptors and or heritonoancogy. And it is essential to search for factors that can better stratify patients for systemic therapy. So having said that, as more advances are made in molecular genetics and more molecular targeted therapies become available, the responsibility of pathologists to find the right answers for the right patients will become greater. And this approach will form the foundation of the delivery of quality personalized breast health care that naturally we all are looking forward to. So with that, I know that we still have a long way to go in order to be able to really have that perfect individualized, personalized breast care for all the patients across the globe. But at least this is a great start as we see that. So this component of my lecture was meant to try to bring everybody on board as what is the current status of the morphology and biology correlation and what is really the expect expectation of us as pathologists to become a team player in clinical practice and provide our clinician with the information that they need to better treat their patients. So having said that, and having put this information in front of you, I'm trying to move towards something that naturally is very practical and really focus on the question of why there is such an emphasis on breast cancer. What we know is that breast cancer is the most common cancer among women across the globe, accounting for 22% of 4.7 million new cancer cases per year. This is the second leading cause of cancer death among women. And women who die from breast cancer lose an average of 20 years of life. So this is a major public health problem across, across the globe. Breast cancer is a physical and psychosocial threat to women's life. And naturally, when a woman gets sick, the entire family gets sick. And this is a significant burden to the family and those patients that those children that they lose their mother to breast cancer, they become orphaned and they don't have a mother to take care of them. So you can understand the significance of this disease as it stands right now across the globe. So the significance of breast cancer and the impact on a patient's life has resulted to unbelievable amount of effort at international level by a variety of different disciplines and organizations to try to make a difference. So these differences have led to the following information. We have enhanced public awareness and screening, improvement in breast imaging, introduction of minimally invasive diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, 
interest in breast cancer risk reduction and prevention, discovery of breast cancer genes and molecular pathways, introduction of molecular targeted therapy, and building comprehensive breast centers and establishment of rapid assessment clinics. So these are all the result of an unbelievable degree of effort to try to make things easier for patients with breast cancer. Now, what I want to stress the rest of this conversation today is really to talk about breast cytopathology. The reason that I'm focusing on that because breast cytopathology and finding the laceration biopsy is a time challenge concept across the globe. And that has resulted to you know, initiation and establishment of rapid assessment clinics, rapid diagnostic center, finding the laceration biopsy clinic, that the major strength of this clinic is the ability to provide rapid diagnosis for patients that they can benefit from this technology and this approach. Now, who will come to this clinic? These are people that majority are symptomatic patients. They come with mass, nipple discharge, skin changes, nipple retraction, and newly discovered abnormality. So this slide particularly is representing the need for significant number of medically underserved population in different countries of the world that they really do not have access to the screening mammography. They do not have access to the unbelievable degree of you know, personal possibilities for women with either different palpable or for that matter, the screening mammography and, and asymptomatic abnormalities that is discovered by screening mammography. And in that setting, this is incredibly important to keep in mind that if we would be able to have this clinic and have people there that they can examine the patient and they can provide some diagnostic material for pathologies or cytopathologies to look at it, this provides the first step in providing a better care to the patients. For your information, there are countries in the world that patients with fibroadenomas, they undergo mastectomy because there is no way of knowing what it is. And since occasionally fibroadenomas become very large, they just you know, decide to just remove the breast totally in order to try to remove that breast. So the concept is something that we have to be very sensitive to the concept of breast cancer being a global disease and not only take a look at the high end of the process where patients may receive a lot of attention if and when there is a problem for them. So what will this clinic offer? prompt diagnosis and follow-up therapy for patients with malignancies, alleviation of anxiety for patients with benign conditions. It is definitely very cost-effective, and of course, it increases patient satisfaction. The required infrastructure for this facility, wherever they can be built, is that the healthcare provider examines the patient and triage for the next step. There is ability to provide rapid diagnosis, which can be done by finding an aspiration biopsy, which requires availability of experienced cytopathologists or pathologists to perform the procedures and interpret the cytologic finding. And of course, when I'm talking about this, I'm, I'm trying to also bring another component of possibilities and that is the use of digital pathology will provide a means for people that they may not have the experience to just transfer that image to the people outside of their area and then try to seek help for providing that diagnosis from people, from pathologists that they have experience on that. And we're actually hoping to be able to try to really provide these kind of services simply because this is the best and fastest way that you can provide diagnosis to the patients, which naturally subsequently leads to better management of patients with breast lesions. 
Now, another component that is similarly important is building the possibility of doing core needle biopsy. Um, and that, of course, requires availability of breast imager to perform core needle biopsy. And these are image detected biopsies and availability of experienced cytopathologists or pathologists to prepare imprint cytology and interpret the results. What it requires is effective communication of test result to the patient and appropriate follow-up planning based on test result. These are the possibilities that if it is done properly, in one day, a patient can come, do the procedure, get the result, have a treatment planning, and then go and come back for further management. And this is something that actually, you know, uh, I spent three months at Cori Institute looking at what they do in their breast care. And this was one of the most important really aspects of the practice that the patient walk in. In eight, nine o'clock in the morning, by the time that she leaves, she's diagnosed, she has a, 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 a paper um, defining and detailing what is the next step and where she needs to go. Now, Finding the last version bias is a very simple procedure to redo. It does not really need um, anesthesia. This is mostly for palpable lesions, even though there have been trial of doing finding the last version biopsy of non-palpable lesion and their image detected you know, possibilities. So basically is trying to identify the mass and then you know try to you know introduce the needle and then make a slide and then look at this case. And of course, the beauty of finding the last version biopsy is that because it's a very a traumatic type of experience, the needle can be inserted in different parts of that mass so that you can better sample the lesion and provide a better diagnosis. For imprint cytology, again, if somebody would do the core needle biopsy, the core needle biopsy can be placed between the two slides and the imprint of that core needle biopsy can be provided. And then of course, there is an on-site, you know, possibilities that you can stain the smears both for fine needle and imprint cytology, as you can see it in here. And then you have an on-site on cancer diagnosis. Now, we have all the possibilities in here <clears throat> to introduce telecytopathology. We just wrote a comprehensive information in CAP today about this, that you, 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 you place the cytologic you know, preparation and send it anywhere that you want, that you can get an answer. So you don't necessarily need a cytopathologist on site. Now, what is it that you're trying to achieve by doing minimally invasive procedures? The goals are to eliminate the need for open biopsy in benign disease because if you would be able to establish the diagnosis and then there is, you know, there is no other issues that we have to keep under consideration, the people really don't need to undergo surgical excision and have a scar in their breast. Fibrocystic change and cyst formation is a very common process that can be alleviated, alleviated it can be re re resolved by doing fine needle aspiration biopsy. And of course, it provides a non-surgical means to diagnose breast cancer. So this is finding the last version biopsy. This is the needle. This is what I was talking about that because of the small nature of the needle, this needle can go in different part of this mass and sample the lesion properly. Whereas in core needle biopsy, there is larger core and then one attempt may ultimately displace the mobile targets such as fibroadenoma, and you may not be able to really sample the lesion. So fine needle is, is, a, is, a, is really a, a, a fantastic way of sampling lesions. Now, the things that we have to really consider is the fact that fine needle aspiration biopsy is practically deviation from a standard of the way that we use to diagnose breast lesions. In finding that we are depending on a few single, you know, two more cells to try to make a diagnosis versus the time that we had to have the entire mass, take a look at it, do multiple sections, and then make a diagnosis. 
So you can see that it's different and it's difficult, it's challenging. And finding the laceration by FC is practically like a keyhole. You're looking at the keyhole and trying to see the entire room. So what it means that, what it means that you need to be a good surgical pathologist and know what the room should look like in order to be able to look through the hole and see what is it that you are looking at that and what that is small number of tumor cells represent. So it's a very important really consideration to really have that one in mind when you're looking at finding the laceration biopsy procedure. One of the applications of finding the laceration biopsy is very similar to surgical pathology. We need to establish a diagnosis, classify a neoplasm, differentiate between primary and secondary, predict the response to therapy, and provide predictive information. Very similar to what I just described to you in the role of pathologists. The value of finding the laceration biopsy is providing a diagnosis when surgical biopsy may not be available. It just, I mean, we are still seeing patients like this in our emergency room. When you see this advanced breast cancer, ulcerated, fungated, you see all the areas that they are involved by tumor and we do a finding the laceration biopsy in affected lymph node to try to establish the diagnosis. And of course, we talked about therapeutic evacuation of benign cysts. It is highly easy for patients to accept this approach quickly. And of course, cost effectiveness of breast finding and laceration biopsy has already been established in several studies, including ours. Now, when you use uh, a bedside and immediate you know, diagnosis on the site of the patient, you practically not only, you know, provide that type of diagnosis, but you are practicing a very cost-effective practice. This is a study that they had shown that, you know, just looking at over 5,000 cases, um, the agreement has been 85% with the surgical follow-up cases, and there has been reduction in non-diagnostic specimen from 0% versus 20% that it used to be. And you can see the cost effectiveness over five years. So it's a very cost effective procedure. Let me spend some time and talk about on-site evaluation of finding the laceration by FC and what are the advantages. Um, advantages include determination of adequacy, triage of the specimen for ancillary studies, and providing preliminary diagnosis and assist in rapid clinical decision making. Of course, diagnostic challenges that is associated with finding the laceration by FC of the breast is there are entities that finding the laceration by FC cannot provide um, always the definitive diagnosis. And these are the cases that they have to undergo follow up surgical excision. And these are atypical hyperplasia versus low grade carcinoma, papillary lesions, fibroepithelial lesion, sclerosing lesion, mucinous, and status of invasion. And of course, radial scar and sclerosing lesion can be added to that. So, whenever we are suspicious of these kind of entities, the wise approach to that is to follow up with a surgical excision of the entire lesion with a rim of normal breast tissue, because in that sense, if you find the you know, cancer in that sample, this is going to be like a surgical lumpectomy concept, and the patient really doesn't have to go through anything else if the diagnosis can be established. What are the reported sensitivity and specificity of fine needle in, this is what we had reported sometimes ago in 3,000 palpable breast lesions. Um, this, these are the sensitivity and specificity, which is, Pretty good statistics for palpable breast lesions. These statistics, however, is different when they had started to use fine needle aspiration biopsy for non palpable lesions. And then you can see that the issue that has really brought a lot of um, problem for advocating breast fine needle aspiration biopsy is the number of insufficient cases. And now, naturally, that has resulted. To the, to the process that um, associated with advances in breast imaging and, and really effort of radiologists 
to, to be able to really capture the entire service that has resulted to core needle biopsy to become the preferred um, diagnostic sampling for patients with not only non-palpable breast lesions or screen detected lesions, but also for palpable lesions. So recently and, and for a long time right now, core needle biopsy has been the one that finds the lesion. And you have these small little core needle biopsies that is very familiar for surgical pathologies. So they, go, they don't really have to have a special training in cytopathologies. And not only you can diagnose it morphologically, but you can use the, all the biomarkers that is needed for breast cancer management. So core needle biopsy right now has dominated the practice. And this is something that is going to stay. Benefit of finding the laceration by FC, lower complication rate can be performed by cytopathologists and pathologists. It's a rapid procedure, usually does not require anesthesia, less traumatic, low bleeding risk, and can be performed anywhere, less expensive. And of course, flexibility in specimen preparation for collection. The benefit includes collection of fresh, intact viable cells, more suitable for fish or any kind of other studies, rapid turnaround time, no prolonged formalin fixation and tissue processing, easier to sample lesion more broadly because of multiple passes in various directions. Drawback of fine needle require the specialized exper expertise and training, equipment in breast pathology and cytopathology. We have limited tissue architecture, which is important in tissue diagnosis. Questions, possibility of diagnosing of in situ versus invasive cancer, and lower yield of fibrotic and densely cohesive lesions such as infiltrating rubber carcinoma. What about the benefit of coronal biopsy? provides larger intact tissue fragments with preserved architecture. Tissue processing and histology is similar to any surgical pathologist. Therefore, cytopathology training is not needed. And of course, validate tissue for ancillary studies or immunohistochemistry. And of course, higher diagnostic yield for fibrotic or cohesive soft tissue lesion. What are the drawbacks of coordinator biopsy? Generally not performed by a pathology cytopathologist. It requires presence and expertise of radiologists. It's more expensive, requires the use of anesthesia, longer tissue fixation and processing time, formally fixed paraffin embedded tissue, and a higher complication. And this is an example of an extensive bleeding and hematoma following coronal biopsy. And of course, we can have infarction of lesions such as fibroadenomas or papillomas by the use of core needle biopsy. That we have to be very careful. So, what is it that is more appropriate uh, to be able to use both fine needle and core needle biopsy? What is that comprehensive approach? Fine needle aspiration biopsy and core needle biopsy can and should be utilized together for the best management of patients with breast lesions. However, radiologic and clinical findings should guide the decision as to which procedure should be used. Difficult to diagnose lesions are similar in fine needle aspiration biopsy and core needle biopsy. And the triple test plays a critical role in the accurate interpretation of both. Now, this is just an example of increased incidence of malignancy at excision when core needle biopsy have been diagnosed. And these are the diagnoses that they are very similar to what I just presented to you for breast cytopathology, that when we make these diagnoses on core needle biopsy, these are the cases that they have to be followed by surgical excision so that we don't lose the opportunity of finding invasive cancer. So in that scenario, again, this is very similar to finding the last patient biopsy practice. 
So what are the common issues in fine needle aspiration biopsy and core needle biopsy? They represent a small sample size. And there are naturally sampling errors. They have similar diagnostic limitations as we have discussed. And there is absolute need for an integrated approach between radiologists, pathologists, and breast physicians, whoever that breast physician may be, the primary care person, surgeon, oncologist, anyone who is taking care of the patient, there has to be an effective communication between all of these individuals to try to make sure that the nature of the tumor and the follow-up management is well defined. So what is the approach that we are uh, sort of pretty much um, advocating for? If we have a setting with everything that I discussed, palpable lesions can undergo first-time test as fine needle aspiration biopsy. If it is a benign lesion, and there is no other indication of any other problem. It's called benign and it undergoes follow up. If it is malignant, it undergoes therapy. And if indeterminate and we don't know what they are, these are the cases that they need to either to go core needle biopsy or excisional biopsy. Now, what about non palpable lesion? Non palpable lesion, if they're cystic, Ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration biopsy is the best really approach to try to evacuate this cyst and also provide cytologic material for diagnosis. If it is solid or we have microcastification, the patient has to go undergo a stereotactic core needle biopsy. And the follow up is the same, all of them. If it's benign, the patient undergo follow up. If it is malignant, it will go under therapy. If this is indeterminate, as we have discussed it, it will go to coronal biopsy or excisional biopsy. And this way, you go step by step to try to use the, the most less expensive, less traumatic approach until you get to the diagnosis that will define the pathology of that specific breast cancer or breast cancer patient. What are the facts that we need to keep under consideration? Training in breast cytopathology is, is essential. We need to really know what is it that we are talking about when we are trying to um, make a diagnosis on cytologic preparations. And the reason is very simple. ATPO does not always signify malignancy in breast fine needle aspiration waves because absence of ATPO does not exclude malignancy. And diagnosis of breast fine needle aspiration biopsy should be based on interpretation of defined cytomorphology in the context of the other available clinical findings. Let me present to you a few examples. I mean, this is an example of a 25-year-old who underwent fine needle aspiration biopsy and read by a pathologist as malignant tumor cells present. Well, this is looking at a case that actually happened in Jacksonville. And uh, I was to look into this case and surgeons by the diagnosis of malignancy in fine needle aspiration biopsy went ahead. And at that time, they were just doing, if there is an indication of malignancy, they would just go directly to uh, frozen section diagnosis. And after that, uh, they would, in this case, they didn't even go into you know, frozen section diagnosis with that diagnosis of fine needle aspiration by FC on, um, malignancy on fine needle aspiration by FC, the surgeon decided to just go ahead and do mastectomy in this patient. And then when the results came, ultimately, this was just a simple fibroadenal. And of course, this was a case in the United States, naturally, is a, is, a, is, is, is a place that people really go ahead and sue the physicians when there is evidence of negligence. So this uh, patient received about $2.7 million worth of this mistake. And it was simply because of the fact that nobody really paid attention to the fact that the patient is too young. The patient doesn't have any family history of breast cancer. 
And furthermore, the ultrasound had shown that this is just a benign lesion. So there wasn't anything that would indicate that um, this, uh, this cytology represents a malignancy. And why this malignancy come into picture? Because of the fact that, yes, you have these clusters of cells, these are epithelial cells, and you see a lot of other dispersed cell component in here. And these are simply myopithelial cells. Look at these elongated, uh, just naked nuclei in the background. So if somebody has paid attention to that, they would have not ever made a diagnosis of malignancy in this case. So this is the reason that is important for whoever is diagnosing various cytopathology, they have the training and experience to do so. Otherwise, they may make mistakes. The other component is the fact that truly atypia in breast cytopathology does not mean malignancy. For example, look at this nuclei. And there is something cleopanosinotosis in them. They have nucleoli. They're very you know, unpredictable. And you can see the you know, single cells you know, all over in here. But look at the background. You can see these all degenerative neutrophils and inflammatory cells. And this is just the case of subaural abscess that you know, shown evidence of inflammatory atypia in the background of an inflammatory process. So that's the reason that it never should be diagnosed as malignant tumor cells. On the other hand, there are entities in breast pathology and breast cytopathology that they are not associated with significant atypia. Examples, this is lobular neoplasia or lobular carcinoma. Lobular carcinoma is any, anything that it, it comes into the lobular neoplasia area. You can see a very well-defined, very single cell, monotonous appearing cells. The same thing with tubular carcinoma. One cell type, they're all the same. They correlate with each other. They're associated with each other. There is no disparity. There is no argument. There is no problem in these classes of cells. And these are representation of low-grade carcinomas. So you don't have to have ATPO to cause something malignant. And at the same time, you don't have to have, you know, all of the component of um, ATP and call it, you know, inflammation. You need to take a look at the component of uh, what you are really looking at that. And again, we are going to probably talk about that a little bit. But these are one single cell type. These are a one single cell type. They're all the same. There's no myoepithelial cell. There's nothing in the background. Therefore, this is, this is not, difficult to try to take a look at it and, uh, and make the diagnosis of low-grade carcinoma in the cytopathology. The classification of fine needle aspiration biopsy fall into one of the five categories. In each category should be further described as appropriate. Benign gets follow-up. Atypical is indeterminate, so it has to undergo biopsy. Suspicious have to go to biopsy. Malignant can go to treatment and unsatisfactory need repeat sample. And these are again, one more time. These are the entities. These are diagnostic issues that when they are suspected in fine needle aspiration by FC, this has to be followed by surgical excision. And this is exactly the same recommendation that is there for patients that they are diagnosed with these entities in coronal biopsy. Let's just look at some of them. What are these diagnostic challenges in cytopathology? Um, this is, again, look at this. These are clusters of cell. They're all alike. They're one cell type. This is a low-grade cancer. This is a low-grade DCIS. And this is atypical hyperplasia. You can see two cell type. You can see these spindle, larger cells associated with larger um, pale, paler type of epithelial cells. And then in that setting, this is just a representation of atypical diagonal hyperplasia. But truly, these are difficult to diagnose on an everyday practice of breast cytopathology. Let me take this opportunity and go through the process of how the whole spectrum of what we use to call it um, fibrocystic change look like. 
And I have created a sort of satellitic system that they would correspond the satellitical features with, with morphological features, which is known as Massoud Cytology Index. And that is based on that comparison. This is non-proliferative breast cysts. These are apocrine cells. For larger cells, they have this isonophilic cytoplasm, and these are epithelial cells and myoepithelial cells. And you can see the space between the individual cells. They're comfortable with each other. They're living together. This is myoepithelial cell, and this is epithelial cell. And it's very similar to what we see in surgical pathology, because cysts, these are apocrine cells. These are just a few epithelial cells. So this is just a representation of a non-proliferative breast disease. When the cells start to proliferate, these are the ductal cells that you can see proliferation of epithelial cells crossing the border. And again, when you look, look at cytology, you see again participation of these spindle cell myoepithelial cells and epithelial cell. The polarity is a little gone because of the decay of proliferation. Other than that, there is really, it's just a simple proliferative breast disease without ATP. When we get into the breast cancer precursors and atypical ductal heart population and so on and so forth, it is sort of a different spectrum of changes. Cytologically, what you see, there's significant proliferation. Look at the number of cells that they're practically on the top of each other. They're clear, you know, making these uh, you know, irregularly shaped spaces. You see some degree of, you know, unrest and loss of polarity. The same thing in surgical pathology. I mean, you can see these are epithelial, myoepithelial cells in here that they're transitioning to become monoclonal, to become one cell type, and then probably go into the process of becoming a low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. This is non comedodactyl carcinoma in situ. You can see these duct um, proliferating cells. They're all the same, and they have made this very regularly shaped cribriform pattern. And you can see the same thing, one cell type. They're all the same. And then if you can use an imagination, these are the cribriform. These are the cribriform that is made in here. So this is a non comedo low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. This is high-grade ductal carcinoma in situ. You can see this is high-grade lesion and atypicality, you know, nuclear you know, enlargement, a lot of necrosis in between. And you can see the same thing in cytology. Look at these individual cell necrosis and, you know, atypicality and that is existing individual nuclei. Not difficult to really diagnose. What about lobular nucleation? A typical lobular hyperplasia, lobular carcinoma in situ, have a very distinct cytological feature. They look like grape like um, clusters and they're very monotonous. They're one cell type and there's really not much of loss of polarity in here, very similar to what we see in surgical pathology. Papillary lesions, another entity that is very difficult to make a distinction of. A, Introductal papilloma versus well differentiated papillary carcinoma. How do we make that distinction? You can see that there are different cell types in introductal papilloma. You can see some of the larger cells, some apocrine cells. You can see the <clears throat> epithelial, epithelial cells in here. You can see some tall columnar cells in here. And then, of course, <clears throat> this is the quick preparation of the same thing, showing again two cell types, smaller thicker, uh, darker cells of my epithelial cells sort of intermingled with epithelial cells. And when we do my epithelial cell immunocytochemistry in cell block preparation of the fine needle, you can see these are the calconin that is very nicely positive, showing the presence of my epithelial cells within this cluster that make it definitely an intubacal papilloma. What about papillary carcinoma? I mean, look at this cytologic preparation. This is one component of a papillary carcinoma. You can see this growth of um, tumor cells. And they have this papillary growth pattern. You can see some of these cells are just falling out in, in different component of it. Um, again, they have this tall columnar cell appearance. And this is calponin, which is my epithelial cell marker. 
and you see no trace of my epithelial cells in here. My epithelial cells are supporting cells of the ductal element, and they are there around the ductal system. And whenever that there is a neoplastic process happening, they produce, they, they refuse to participate in the process because they're supporting components. They don't want to become involved in a neoplastic process, so they go away. So whenever my epithelial cells go away in your preparation, it means that you probably are looking to a, not to a neoplastic process. And this is exactly what you're seeing in here versus what I just showed you. So what about fibroadenomas? Fibroepithelial lesions are, are the most commonly sampled lesion, especially in young women. And in the classical form of that, that's very easy to diagnose. And they're just a combination of mesenchymal element and epithelial element. You can see a lot of my epithelial cells and naked nuclei in the background as we talked about that. In the usual classical fibroadenoma, they have this, what they call it, antler horn pattern. That sort of defines fibroadenoma. And that is what we see in what fibroadenoma is a part of fibroepithelial lesion. And this is classical form of the fibroadenoma. This is again entities that whenever there are more cellular type, there are more myoepithelial cells, there are more um, perhaps a larger epithelial component associated with that. You will still see the mesenchymal element in here. You see the two cell type. This is very important. If you even remember one thing from this lecture is when you see two cell type in any cytologic preparation, think again before you call it malignant. And of course, these are the myoepithelial cells that they show um, presence of myoepithelial cells. So this is P63 immunostain that shows presence of myoepithelial cells. And of course, fibroepithelial lesion, uh, fibroadenoma can, uh, can mimic, as, you know, a cellular fibroadenoma can mimic benign fluid tumor, that they are much more cellular. There's a considerable component of uh, of um, mesenchymal and background, you know, cellularity and increased uh, component of uh, the mesenchymal element. And then of course, you can see this, for example, this is quite cellular mesenchymal background. And of course, these are called benign or possibly borderline. And when they get malignant, they have significant atypicality, mitosis and other heterologous element that you need to be very, very careful with not to underdiagnose fibroadenoma or fibro malignant fluid tumor. And you need to pay attention to the presentation, the size, the age of the patient, and have multiple slides to take a look at it. And when you don't and cannot make a diagnosis, just call it fibroepithelial lesion and then ask them to excise the lesion. What about myosinous lesion? Mucinous carcinomas, they occur in older age group, and you can see the mucinous material here. These are, you know, naturally epithelial proliferation. This is cell block, that shows very nice presence of these classes of cells in, in the mucinous background. And this has to be um, defined and separated from mucosyl, which happens in younger age group, is associated with proliferative lesions, but Technically, they can look very similar to what is seen in mucinous carcinoma. And of course, again, myopithelial cell marker can help and the age of the patient can help. Also, whenever we have mucinous lesions or we have signet ring cells, you always have to look at, aside from signet ring carcinoma or infiltrating globular carcinoma, you have to look at metastatic tumors. This is a lesion that has a lot of mucin as you can see it in cell blood preparation. And this was a patient that we were aware of the fact that the patient has colon cancer. So when we did the aspiration biopsy, we used a little bit for EM, liver microscopic examination. And you can see very nicely this villi, which naturally defines that as a metastatic tumor from GI tract. And with that history, this is a metastatic cancer from colon to the breast, which is naturally very interesting. Now, there's always argument about, can we make a diagnosis of in situ versus invasive cancer? 
And yes, this is difficult. However, when you see um, aspirates that you can see dispersed cell pattern, and you can see differences in nuclear size. Look at the nuclear size of this versus this, versus this, versus this. These are no longer a happy family. This is cancer, this is an invasive cancer, versus cancers that they are inside of, they are sealed together within that vessel structure. So, Diagnostic clues to try to make a distinction between in situ versus invasive cancer or recognition of a special subtype of breast cancer, such as mucinous medullary and small cell carcinomas, presence of a skin retraction, fixed nipple ulceration, presence of inflammatory carcinoma, evidence of metastatic disease, and recognition of intracystic carcinoma. Now, one of the most important components in practice of breast pathology with minimally invasive procedures of both fine needle and core needle biopsy is knowing that radiology and pathology correlation is the essential component of this practice. We need to make sure that what we are seeing in pathology, either core needle biopsy or fine needle, is representation of what is being seen in radiology. So in respect to breast imaging modalities, the, 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 the devices that now, right now they are available and they are being used excessively is naturally mammogram is the first one and ultrasound, tomosynthesis, uh, which is a little bit more advanced form of mammography, and of course, MRI that comes into you know, selected cases that the people need more information to have in respect to the <clears throat> MRI findings <clears throat> in a given breast lesion. Now, I'm going to use this uh, slide, which is a busy slide, and I need you to just stay with this for a little while so that we can talk about how our radiologists are looking at these breast cases and what language do they use and what all of these criteria, what does it really mean? And that is looking at the concordance between BIRAD assessment categories and management recommendation. This is taken from College of Radiology and Reporting System. And they, they are using BIRAT system, which the scope is category zero, all the way to category six. And of course, the spectrum is zero that is incomplete, need additional information. Category one is negative, that routine mammography screen is fine, and there is essentially 0% of likelihood of malignancy. Catebara 2 is benign, and you can just follow up with routine, routine mammography screening. And again, essentially, there is 0% likelihood of malignancy. Category 3 is probably benign. So it requires short-term interval of follow-up, and of course, surveillance mammography and all of that has to be considered. 0% but less than 2% likelihood of malignancy is associated with category 3 BIRAT. BIRAT 4 is suspicious. And this is again uh, has been uh, categorized as category A, 4A, 4B, 4C. And no matter what kind of this category you are referring to or radiologist referring to, that requires tissue diagnosis. And every single one of these is associated with more likelihood of malignancy. When you're talking about 4C, it is high suspicious for malignancy that there are 50 to 95% likelihood of malignancy. And majority of the biopsies that take place, radiologists have called it suspicious because that is what requires tissue diagnosis. Category five, is tissue diagnosis is more than 95% likelihood of malignancy. And category of six is known biopsy proven malignancy and surgical excision is indicated when clinically appropriate. So with this categorization that radiologists are offering us, we need to be very, very appropriately informed of what our radiologists are looking and how they are reporting it on a given case so that we can 
understand the change, understand the language, and try to look at the case proper. So this practice, this concept of trying to coordinate how the patient presents, how the radiologists are looking at that, how we as pathologists are looking at that, and based on a variety of different diagnostic modalities and sampling technique, we need to work together like an orchestra. So no matter who we are and what instrument we are using, ultimately we need to produce a uniform concept and a very pleasant music that everybody can enjoy and nobody would regret having made God forbidden in this diagnosis. So with that, that practically um, completes my presentation in the area that I have been assigned or I have extended a little bit more than that. So this is what the presentation was. So since I have a small little bit of time left with that, I made a decision and I have checked with that, that let us go through the cases that I had sent you previously as unknown cases, and then just go through uh, looking at them because they are, they are good cases. And I just hate to lose the opportunity of giving you the information about the cases that I have sent. And since I still have time, I think that I probably can move forward with that. So this is case number one. This is 66 year old African-American woman uh, history of present illnesses, palpable mass in the right breast on the annual physical exam, and underwent diagnostic mammogram. And in diagnostic mammogram, you can see that there is some abnormality seen in here and seen in here. And you can see it in here, you can see it in here. And for which this is ultrasound, which naturally shows abnormal configuration of a lesion because this is longer than the other part, as you can see it in here. And basically for which coronal biopsy was done. And this is the coronal biopsy. This is the coronal biopsy is of the fragmented portion of the lesion. It's a high power view of that, that you can see this dispersed cell pattern in, within this tissue biopsy. So there is no question that you are dealing with an infiltrating breast carcinoma. And this was just a representation of an invasive lobular carcinoma. So let's spend some time and talk about invasive lobular carcinoma. Invasive breast cancer lobular carcinoma is characterized by loss of normal cell adhesion. Cells are discohesive with a diffuse pattern of infiltration. This is second most common breast malignancy. Five to 15% of all infiltrating breast carcinomas are infiltrating lobular carcinoma. Uh, they occur in women more than 50 years of age. And clinically, they, they have poorly defined palpable mass or areas of thickening. And this is an area that we have to be very careful. One of the, the first reason for false negative breast fine needle aspiration by FCA is infiltrating globular carcinoma because of the fact that they don't really present as a mass. They're ill-defined area of thickening. And therefore, it doesn't really bring all this. And the cells are usually have not much of abnormality or atypia. And that is because of the fact that they lose their cell cohesion. Their, adhesion, their cell adhesion molecule, which is ecaterin, ecaterin, this is lost. That's the reason that the cells don't stay together. They are not forming a mass. They just, I call them, they, they just serve. They go wherever they want to go because they're free. They're not attached together. And one of the reasons that um, they have a different pattern of distant metastasis going to serosal and mucosal place, GI, GYN tract, retroperitoneum, bone, and leptomeninges is simply because of the fact that there is loss of e gene expression. There are some abnormal expression of other ketamine that is listed in here, but the most important component of cells to stay together it is e catering is an adhesion molecule, and that is lost in infiltrated lobular carcinomas. Mammography findings, most common is speculated low equivocal density, um, developing asymmetry, 
architectural distortion. Um, they have that retracted or shrunken breast when diffused, and classification is sort of rare. Ultrasound ultra, abnormalities, the irregular hypoechoic mass with posterior shadowing, uh, focal shadowing, no discrete mass again, rarely circumscribed mass. MRI finding most common or irregular speculated mass with heterogeneous enhancement, 56%. Dominant mass with surrounding foci, skin in the range of 31%, 23%. Non mass enhancement, 20 to 40%. Multiple small foci and interconnecting septal enhancements, about 25% of them. And the kinetics is delayed phase, washout occurs less frequently than with infiltrating vector carcinoma. And this is how invasive lower carcinoma look like, characterized by a proliferation of small cells that they lack adhesion. This is the most uh, frequently seen pattern that you see in infiltrating lower carcinoma. And of course, cells that are beyond the small and they really don't have much of a typicality and by immunocytochemistry, these have um, negative ecatera. And again, their characters are for proliferation of cells that they like adhesion, as you can see in here, uh, the round and oval and immunocytochemistry. And these are again, you have this targeting pattern around the dactyl system. Uh, ecatherin is negative, the other Ecatherin or catenin, catenin stains are positive. They're often ER positive and hertonal negative. And this is practically a typical example of infiltrating globular carcinoma. And uh, that is the most important, really, morphological features of that. You have classical form of globular carcinoma that there is much less atypicality. If you see more pleomorphism and uh, some more of signaling appearance and some mitosis, you need to think about pleomorphic type, lobular carcinoma, that they are very different and they often behave like dactyl carcinoma inside, the dactyl carcinoma. So that's an infiltrating lobular carcinoma. Number, case number two is 47 year old African American woman, and the history of present illnesses. The patient has had dactyl carcinoma in situ of the left breast, lower inner quadrant, and underwent diagnostic mammogram. And this is, you know, abnormality seen in, 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 in mammogram, as you can see it in here. Um, the patient underwent stereotactic core needle biopsies here. This is the, you know, the, the sample with area of abnormality, the core biopsy. And then this is the pathology of that. You see this aggregate of tumor cells, again, within the boundary of my epithelial cells in here. And you can see the same thing. You, have seen, you see the central necrosis and the cohesive component of these dactyl structures. And this is you know, basically a recurrent dactyl carcinoma in situ with the history of patient having dactyl carcinoma in the past. Number dactyl carcinoma in situ, breast carcinoma is limited to the DAC with no extension to beyond the basement mem membrane. These are non invasive proliferation of cohesive neoplastic cell confined to the dactyl lobular system. Clinically, radiologically, and histologically, they're very heterogeneous. Recurrence rate is generally low compared to the other top of cancer, less than 50% for patients that have lumpectomy followed by radiation therapy. About 50% of the lesions that initially present as DCIS recur as such. The same cancer recurs. And characteristics associated with increased risk of recurrence are not receiving adjuvant radiation therapy, high grade dactyl carcinoma in situ. Dactyl carcinoma in situ is that they are greater than one centimeter. Pre menopausal patients, those that they have positive margin and of course, African-American descent. Mammographic findings, classification is one of the most important, really, feature that is seen in a screening mammography. That's the reason that the number of diagnoses of DCIs has increased significantly. They're fine linear or branching. These are highly suspicious of malignancy, 
course heterogeneous, less than 25% of BCIS, fine pleomorphic, there are majority of the cases, and these are the rest of the features, mass fit classification and asymmetry alone. Ultrasound sensitivity is 50% for DCIS. Um, unless you have you're dealing with papillary ductal carcinoma in situ, which produces as an intersex, intercystic or circumscribed mass. Um, ultrasound can show dilated duct, isolated calcification, and occasionally seem only subtle hypoechoic distortion. MRI finding most common linear ductal or segmental clamped non-mass enhancement and variable kinetics show persistent or plateau most commonly the features of MRI finding. Now, the case number three is 70 year old African American woman. Um, he had painful right breast slant for two days, uh, has had 30 pound weight loss in a year. On physical exam, contour deformity of the right breast, later firm nodule in the right upper quadrant and were quadrant palpation and palpable right axillary movement. And of course, you can see that diagnostic mammogram is showing this um, abnormality in here and in here and in here. It is an ultrasound that definitely shows very, very um, conspicuous and abnormal findings in here. There is no longer the round regular contour, and you can see the, um, the increased diameter of the, this part compared to the other part. So this is definitely malignant looking. And the, the pathology um, with the corneal biopsy showed these uh, classes of highly atypical and significant necrosis. Um, and when you really look at it more, what is the most characteristic feature of this case is the fact that they have this eosinophilic apocrine cytoplasm, and there is extensive necrosis in here. And this is the typical example of apocrine carcinoma, and it had areas of uh, apocrine type that are carcinoma inside. In respect to the terminology of apocrine carcinoma, these are carcinoma with apocrine differentiation, invasive apocrine carcinoma, apocrine carcinoma, these are the terminology used. The rare subtype of the breast cancer is less than 1%, uh, and incidence varies between 0.3 to 4%. In respect to epidemiological features, clinical features and mammography findings, they resemble other types of cancer. Mammographically, we have looked at it, suspicious calcification, irregular mass, develop, developing asymmetry and architectural distortion. Ultrasound showed irregular mass with non-circumscribed margin as we looked at it. MRI finding is non-mass enhancement, complex cystic and solid mass with heterogeneous enhancement. And this is how apocrine carcinoma really looked like. Cells with abundant granular cytoplasm or vacuolated cytoplasm, distinct cell border, large nuclei with mark or moderate epithelial, prominent nuclei. DCIS with apocrine morphology usually compromised or usually is associated or accompanies the invasive cancer. These tumor are typically positive for GCDFP15 positivity. GATO3 is positive and your hormone receptors are negative, androgen receptors is positive, and HER2 oncogene is positive. The diagnostic criteria used for apocrine carcinoma, they have to have more than 90% of tumor cells should have apocrine morphology, as you can see in this case. And of course, it's desirable to have your negative, your negative, and androgen receptor immunoprofile. So number four, does a finding the last patient biopsy of a mobile palpable mass in a 25-year-old woman? Um, this is something that you had seen it before. This just look like this is just a typical example of fibroadenoma, biphasic pattern, mesenchymal epithelial. 
and you have these individual cell naked nuclei in the background and anterior horn. And this is a case of fibroadenoma. And certain morphology of fibroadenoma, they're associated with high cellularity, a stromal fragment, cis of monolayer, tactile epithelial cells forming antelope horn, bipolar naked nuclei, occasional apocrine cells, and rare multinucleic giant cells. Differential diagnosis, fibroadenoma naturally falls into fibroepithelial lesions. You have to always consider benign fluidus tumor and the possibility of pseudoangiomatous hyperplasia as differential diagnosis. If you are not sure about the diagnosis, well, this was again a, a young patient, very typical example of fibroadenoma. So you can call it fibroadenoma. If there is any doubt, call it fibroepithelial lesion. The differential diagnosis of benign flow tumor, ask them to take out the lesion. That's my last case. This is a nipple fluid cytology of 78 year old woman with unilateral nipple discharge and no other abnormalities. And this is the cytomorphology of that. You see all these highly uh, chrom high, high chromatic uh, pattern in individual cells. Um, they are very irregularly shaped, they're very different. And there is no other cell associated with that. So naturally with nipple discharge or blood in nipple fluid, cancer is something that has to come in mind. And you see a little bit of the, you know, sort of the red blood cell things in some of these cells. So with this abnormality, um, I, I just call it malignant. Um, when I called the clinician, he said that well, there's really nothing else abnormal in this case. And I said, believe me, this patient has cancer and you need to go and do, if not a very nice tactic to me to see what is the nature of his nipple discharge. And this was found to be an early dichotomy carcinoma in situ. This is actually the earliest dichotomy carcinoma in situ in cytology that I have diagnosed. And you can see this only one DAC. And this one DAC is leading to that nipple, bloody nipple discharge. And a part of that process seems to be an disclosing into dichotypinoma here. And the rest of it is this solid growth pattern of rectal carcinoma inside. So this was a very interesting case with a very unexpected type of <clears throat> diagnosis that, you know, it was, it was great that we were able to make that diagnosis at that early age. So with that, I am finishing my talk is an hour and a half. So we have plenty of time for any questions that you may have. And this is the, this is the picture of our Jacksonville beach. This is the Panavido area. This is uh, uh, our ocean in here. And this is my own painting. So I'm just inviting you whenever you come to Jacksonville, Florida, please look me up. We would love to have you here and show you our department. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity. So, are you still there? And start with the countries, right? So that we can begin to build out and also on in parallel the proof of concept for the alternate, right? Because that. Hi, Charlotte. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <coughs> so, how was it? It was great. It was great. Thanks so much. We we do have uh, some questions um, or one question. It says, looking at the proposed use of the biopsy method in a palpable lesion, FNA done, result malignant, you propose that patients should be treated. What material would be used for IHC? Thanks for the beautiful educative lecture. So how do you, can you talk about how you use IHC when you're doing FNA? Um, well, that's a, that's a very, very important question because that's something that actually is very important simply because uh, right now with pre-surgical neuroagenic chemotherapy, it's important to know the biomarker or the, the predictive and prognostic factors, ERMP or inheritance oncogene. Within our department, we, we usually use our cell blood preparation, which we always try to get sample that is sufficiently cellular enough 
that not only we can make a diagnosis, but also we have a portion of that very similar to any other cell blood group patient that we do in, in cytology, because that is what the information or the validation of these PR and PR and HER2 oncogen is sort of established on. So we just use them for ER and PR and HER2 oncogen, which are the three most important biomarker that needs to be available for our oncologists to make a decision of what kind of pre-surgical chemotherapy he or she is maybe using. So that is what we do. Very occasionally, we can just use a, you know, a sort of a, a direct smear of the fine needle aspiration biopsy, and that is very appropriate for fish technology because the cells are dis dispersed and you can do that very easily without having the nuclei staying on the top of each other and you know, make it difficult to interpret. But basically, cellular preparation is the best thing to do because you have validated um, component of the positive and negative control that are important for interpretation and doing the testing. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Masood. And just for the audience uh, to be clear, a couple of resources for you. Number one, ASCP previously has done um, an, AS, uh, an Africa Calls cytology session on cell block preparation, different methods of doing that, how you can do it in low resource settings, et cetera. I will share that with Gloria to share with all of you. You can watch that at your leisure and it goes into the details of how to make cell blocks, how to use them, Fermius to chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's a really great uh, discussion. I believe Ron Balasanian from UCSF did that, and it's really, really helpful. In addition, many of you may have heard of Cepheid Gene Expert Platform. They do have what's called the Breast Strap 4 cartridge that does ERPR HER2 KS67 by RT PCR uh, from, and it can do it from fresh tissue from an FNA that is not available to purchase currently, but there are research opportunities to work with Cepheid to get cartridges to, to use that. So if you have immunohistochemistry in your laboratory now, and you want to work with Cepheid to validate that for FNA, I'm sure they would love to talk with you and provide you with, you know, two, 300 cartridges so that you could do that. But you do need to work with them directly because you can't purchase them right now. However, where that has been done in Tanzania and South Africa, Kenya and Malawi and Rwanda, um, it works beautifully. You get much better results. It's essentially equivalent to IHC and it's done in about two hours and it only costs probably will cost about 45 or 50 US dollars for that cartridge as opposed to say 60 to $75 for the immunohistochemistry reagents only plus time and, 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 and you have to have histology and all that sort of stuff. So, so I do think that's coming down the pipeline. And if that's something this group is interested in, I can share some resources with Gloria and Runsi so they can send them on to you to discuss that. Maxi Odika also says, highly effect educative lecture. Thank you very much. And I don't see any other questions, Dr. Masood. So I think you probably wowed them. I know I was wowed. I thought it was amazing. Um, and this will be recorded uh, and available for them to review. And certainly Gloria and Runsi, we will share those resources on cell blocks uh, for them. Uh, but I think with that, we can conclude for the day. Okay, that sounds good. And um, um, as I said, it was a great experience. It was a, quite a bit of work to see how, how, to, to, how to do this, but I enjoyed this. And please send me the information about this cell block. Uh, you know, Absolutely. Because, we will include you as well. Safia, because we, 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 we would be delighted to work with them. And as a sort of a research aside from that and help them out to get it out in the, in the public, because, I mean, that seems to be amazing alternative. To it the is. that people have. And one of the reasons that finding the respiration biopsy has not been that widely right now, one of the other things is that but we cannot have the you know ER and PR and her no oncogene. And no matter how much I tell them, yes, you really can, this is what you need to do. It still is very yeah. difficult. But if you would be able to really show that it can be done effectively and cheaply, uh, I mean we are we are gonna probably participate in the process of preservation of finding the respiration biopsy of the breast. Absolutely. I don't know how I feel about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Dr. Sadiq said, uh, my lab doesn't run IHC, but we'd be glad if she'd do research and work with us here uh, in Atbuth Bucha, Nigeria. And Dr. Sadiq, as I said, I will send that information um, and see where Sefid is. I, I hope they're very close 
to being able to have this available commercially. Um, it's, it's been a while in the making, uh, but they certainly are still doing um, some research projects. So we will send that information out. Thank you everybody so much. It is Thursday. That means our next session will be on Tuesday. Please make sure you register about 48 hours before that session and you'll get your fresh link for the Tuesday session. Uh, and we will see you all there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. You too, bye-bye.